Planet of the Apes spawned four sequels, two television series, and a mountain of merchandise. It became a cultural phenomenon, and it started as the vision of two men, a French novelist named Pierre Boulle and a Hollywood film producer named Arthur P. Jacobs. <laughs> Born in 1922, Arthur Jacobs began his career as a messenger at MGM in the 1940s. Energetic, forceful, and full of ideas, he soon found himself working in their publicity department. A master of promotion, he was eventually lured away by Warner Brothers. But Arthur wanted control of his own destiny. In 1949, he left Warner's to form his own public relations firm, and within two years, his client roster included such high-profile celebrities as Gregory Peck, Jimmy Stewart, Judy Garland, and Marilyn Monroe. It was Marilyn who helped Jacobs make the transition from publicist to producer in the early 1960s. She agreed to star in a film he was developing called What a Way to Go. But before production could begin, Marilyn Monroe died on August the 5th, 1962. Arthur had lost his star, but not his determination. Hi, folks. In case you didn't know it, that's a girl. All girl. Yeah, Shirley MacLaine. Jacobs got his movie made. What a way to go! The film became one of Fox's top money makers of 1964. Arthur's reputation as a skillful, creative producer was assured. Just after the film's release, Fox studio head Richard Zanuck showed his appreciation by agreeing to finance another Jacobs project called Dr. Doolittle. Starring Rex Harrison, the film featured original songs, dazzling special effects, hundreds of extras, and a large supporting cast of trained animals. The first film in which a human being, myself, actually talks to animals. It was during Doolittle's lengthy pre-production phase that Arthur approached Zanuck with an idea for another motion picture. It too played with the concept of talking to the animals, but in a much more serious way. It was called Planet of the Apes. In 1963, Jacobs had acquired the rights to a novel entitled Le Planète des Singes, or The Monkey Planet, by one of France's most acclaimed authors, Pierre Boulle. Le Planète des Singes told the story of three astronauts who travel to an alien world where man is a primitive beast, dominated by a race of super-intelligent apes. Jacobs read the book shortly before its official publication and quickly purchased the screen rights. He felt that the concept would make for a visually intriguing, highly original motion picture. But Boole disagreed. He considered the novel one of his lesser works with no potential for screen success. During the next few months, Jacobs commissioned a series of sketches depicting his concept of the ape's strange alien world. Seven different artists worked on various concepts as the story evolved. He prepared a merchandising book for Planet of the Apes like nothing I have seen before or since. It was about 130 pages of ideas. And that's what he, uh, Arthur was. He was an idea man. And he was marvelous at it. Jacobs also contacted Rod Serling, a prolific writer most famous for his highly acclaimed Twilight Zone television series. Intrigued by Boole's novel, Serling began adapting it into a screenplay, but the challenge proved harder than anticipated. After nearly a year, he completed more than 30 drafts. With paintings and script in hand, Jacob spent the next year pitching Planet of the Apes to all of the major studios. But everywhere he went, he was met with the same response. No. Rejected and ridiculed, 
Jacobs reached back to his roots as a publicist. He knew there was only one thing that got Hollywood executives excited about a project, a star. On June the 5th, 1965, Arthur made an appointment with one of the most respected and powerful actors in Hollywood, Charlton Heston, a veteran of blockbusters like The Ten Commandments and an Academy Award winner for his performance in Ben-Hur. I was approached by Arthur Jacobs with Pierre Boulle's novel, Planet of the Apes, and a remarkable series of paintings of scenes in the picture that uh, Arthur envisioned. And it attracted me. I liked the idea of the talking monkeys and the different civilization, and it was simply a marvelous idea for a movie. Heston also recommended bringing a director onto the team, Franklin Schaffner, having just finished a film with him called The Warlord. So Arthur already had two key ingredients, a lead actor and a director. And he would go from studio to studio, and they would say, what are you talking about? Spaceships? Talking monkeys? You're out of your mind. That's Saturday morning serials. Get out of here. The reluctance of studio executives isn't hard to imagine. Looks like the real thing. Up to that time, actors in ape costumes were more often found in low-budget B pictures and tended to be more laughable than believable. But despite the obstacles, Jacobs persevered. Finally, uh, Richard Zanuck, who was then running Fox, having just taken it over from his father, said, you know, uh, let's have a meeting on this. I'd made a picture or two with Arthur at that time, and uh, we signed him to a multiple picture deal. So he presented the script, which needed a lot of work, with these sketches, and uh, gave me a small pitch on it. And I read it over the weekend and, and was captivated by it. And, but I had some reservations. Dick Sanek said, uh, these monkeys, they're really going to be actors, right, in makeup, not real monkeys. We said, well, sure, of course. And he said, uh, what if people laugh at the makeups? You know, it could be some very humorous uh, idea if not done properly. And I asked him um, to make this test. On March the 8th, 1966, Arthur and his team went to Fox and shot the test. We erected a jury-rigged set the whole test cost $5,000, which was the limit Dick would give us. Oh, good evening, Mr. Thomas. Feeling fine, I hope. Considering I've been kept in a cage for six weeks, I'm fine, yes. Good. The test featured Charlton Heston and Hollywood legend Edward G. Robinson as the orangutan leader, Dr. Zayas.